Hello and welcome. My name is Amanda Granger. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at the WNET Group, home of Channel 13, America's flagship PBS station in New York City. On behalf of everyone at WNET, I thank you for joining us tonight for the Space Between Stillness and Action, a town hall on recovery and activism after the killing of George Floyd. We present this event as an opportunity to gather with community in a space empowered by self-care, culture, activism, and faith to honor the life of George Floyd and to help make sense of the path ahead. Tonight's program is presented by the WNET Group and Chasing the Dream, our national multi-platform reporting initiative exploring income inequality, opportunity, and justice in America. You can find and watch the programs produced and developed by this initiative at pbs.org slash chasing the dream or youtube.com slash chasing the dream PBS. Please subscribe. Part of our station's mission is to provide meaningful experiences to our audiences and communities to educate, entertain, and inspire. Through our public programs, we hope to inspire your curiosity and compassion so that you can take action in your own community to contribute to a more just world. We will have time for Q&A with the audience towards the end, so as you watch the live stream, please share your questions in the comments section. We hope you'll also join us after for three special upcoming programs. The First 20, a new content initiative from All Arts, explores how the first two decades of the 21st century have forever changed American art, culture, and the collective consciousness. The initiative launches tonight, May 25th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern on All Arts with Michael Muenzo honors George Floyd, a powerful concert homage featuring some of today's greatest black artists gathered on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. The special will stream nationwide on the All Arts app and allarts.org and in the New York metro area on the All Arts TV channel. Here's a short trailer to give you a preview. When things like this happen, we turn to different forms of art. I am Michael Muenzo. We're going to deep dive into the tragic end of the life of a man called George Floyd on the one year anniversary of his death. Through music and conversation. The oppression of anyone is oppression of all. Yeah. I'm going to explore how the death of this man has impacted all of us. Please also join us tomorrow night, Wednesday, May 26th at 5 p.m. Eastern for the closing night of New American Dream. Tomorrow's program is titled Braver Than the One Before It, In Search of the New American Dream, a discussion with five major authors on what the American dream means and can become for people long kept at its margins. Learn more at 13.org slash new American dream. Please also join us the following week for the broadcast of Tulsa, The Fire and the Forgotten, premiering on Monday, May 31st at 9 p.m. Eastern on PBS, PBS.org, and the PBS video app on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Through this documentary, the WNET group aims to raise awareness of racial violence in our nation's history, pay respect to the lives that were taken, and celebrate the resilience of the Black community in Tulsa and all of those fighting for a better future for our nation. And thank you to our sign language interpreters for tonight, Telesi Haynes and LaShonda Lowe. And now I'm pleased to introduce WNET's Community Partnership Specialist and the co-curator of tonight's program, Brian Tate. Thank you so much, Amanda, and welcome everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging and paying deep respect to the Lenape people upon whose unceded and ancestral homeland lies the city we call Manhattan. I invite you to join me in making this acknowledgement from a place of humility and solidarity with an ongoing commitment to decolonization and racial justice. I want to also acknowledge the continuity between our being here today and the collective struggle for liberation and full expression of our humanity that has transcended generations. Many lives have been lost in this struggle in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, in Atlanta, Georgia, in Columbus, Ohio, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and too many other places to name. We hold all those people close 
and we honor their lives when we gather to speak truth and create change. I want to now thank all of you for joining us this evening for the space between stillness and action. We're gonna to move to the conversation. I wanna ask you to join me in welcoming tonight's panel for the space between stillness and action. Uh, please welcome our moderator, award-winning journalist, Michelle Martin, and our panelists, musician and artist, Michael Mwenso, the Reverend Kaji Spellman Doja, senior pastor, the park, Dr. Danielle Harrison, Harrison, APA Black Caucus President and Black Psychiatrist of America Scientific Program Committee Chair. And last, Vincent Sutherland, Executive Director, Center on Race, Inequality and the Law at NYU Law. Thank you all so much for being here. We're looking forward to this conversation. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Shay Cherie. We look forward to welcoming you back to, at the end of this program to give us some inspiration for those days ahead. Thank you all so much for being here. And I want to remind again, all of you joining us that this is a, a conversation that we hope will include all of us. If you have questions or comments or thoughts, we hope you'll put them into the chat. And with that being said, I mean, this year, so much has happened and yet it seems in some ways that little has happened. So I wanna begin by asking each of you as briefly as you can, what does this moment, this moment in which we find ourselves together, this moment in which we commemorate the life, the death, and indeed the afterlife of George Floyd, what does it mean to each of you? And Michael, I'm gonna ask if you would please start as briefly as you can. Thank you and, and thank you for letting me be here and being in this space and to be with everyone today is an honor and blessing. Uh, for me, it, it has, uh, you know, refocused my life in a certain way. It has accelerated uh, things that I wanted to do, opportunities that I, that I have been looking for. It really has recented and reshaped my life in a certain way of giving it more direction and ability to actually have more strength to actually uh, be out here as an artist. So that's what I would say. Interesting, I wanna hear more about that later. Pastor Kaji, what does this year, what does this moment, not necessarily the year, but what does this moment mean to you? And I come to you as a person who is often tasked with helping the rest of us grieve. So Pastor Kaji, what does this moment mean to you? That's right. I mean, George Floyd was murdered at a time when here in New York City, especially, we were, you know, under the constant assault of the sounds of ambulances of people headed to hospital who shouldn't have been in that position in the first place. I don't know. I mean, I know that we're here with so many New Yorkers, but we all remember the sounds of June of 2020. And with that landscape, in that deep space of fear and grief, we learned about what was happening and what had happened to George Floyd. And he joined our homes. He became a part of our lifestyles. He was part of, of the space we inhabit and he still is. And in a particular way, especially because we watched him have the life sapped out of him. For me as a Christian, uh, where we have dealt very much with, with a similar narrative with Jesus Christ, even, who was also murdered by the state. Hmm. This has been a very difficult time. And to look a year later or 2,000 years later and to see how this continues to happen is heart-wrenching, but it's also a point of continuity. And, and so... I, I deal with a lot of both and in this situation, but emotionally it's exhausting. Hmm. Yet I, I have hope that some folks who were able to turn away have started to turn back and there's potential in that. I'll stop there. Hmm. I'd love to hear more about that. Dr. Harrison, what does this moment mean to you, particularly as a person who is tasked with like Pastor, uh, Pastor Kaji, helping us grieve, but also helping us experience and make sense of all the things that are coming at us. What does this moment mean to you? 
Um, well, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to be in this space. Um, what it really means to me is a point of reflection. And the same thing that I would say for my patient or just for the Black community in general, to really reflect and think about where we are, how far we've come, if we've come anywhere. Um, it's We say it's been a year, but George Floyd um, passed away, but we've been dealing with this as a community, as a family, as a people for 400 plus years. We can even talk about Emmett Till. So it's really a point of reflection on where we are, a point of reframing and thinking about what's important, where we should be and what we're going to accept and what we're going to process, but we're, we're no longer going to take as well. Hmm. Vince, a southern one, what about you? I mean, what a remarkable experience this has been as, as others have noted, on the one hand, we saw with our own eyes and not just us. I mean, one of the remarkable things about this experience has been that, and as others have noted, these kinds of killings have happened before, but often it was in the context of sport. You know, we, we know these sort of mass lynchings that people were invited to almost in a sort of a carnival-like atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Other times they have taken place in secret as we know with Emmett Till. And this is that moment which took place in public, but in all of, in front of, you know, all of us, we were, the world kind of saw it. Um, and you are sort of part of a tradition of people who have tried to make change through the law. And, and as, as a person who has dealt within the system through the law and tried to make change, what does this moment mean to you? So, you know, thank you for having me here. And it's a real privilege to be um, in conversation with you all. To me, I think this moment is a mixture of um, hopefulness about the possibilities um, of what tomorrow might bring. Um, having seen so many people uh, rise up against uh, racism and racial inequality, rise up against police violence, rise up against the types of things we've been seeing for centuries in this country over the last year, um, gave me a lot of hope. And at the same time, I think, I feel like we have really not come all that far enough um, just because of all the things that my fellow panelists have talked about and described in terms of the way we've been dealing with these concerns really since the founding of this nation. Um, and, and, and it's been kind of a continuous through line, um, you know, seeing life choked out of George Floyd. Um, he was literally lynched. Um, and, and so, you know, we, we've come a very long way, but we have a tremendous way to go. Um, and so I think there there is that mixture of hopefulness, but also a real recognition of what we have, of the work ahead and, and what that work will take. How do you respond to this? And so when, if you stay with us for a minute, how do you respond to the reality of the conviction of the person who accomplished this act? And it doesn't, who, who did this, it doesn't seem like it, the jury doesn't even seem to have had to, um, argue very deeply about it. It seems that the evidence was quite clear to them. They responded in due course. And yet in the shadow of the, at the very moment, while those deliberations were taking place, another young man was killed, Dante Wright, and a young girl was killed by police within the same sort of sort of time frame. And I just wonder how do you how do you process something like that? How would you understand something like that? You know, Michelle, I mean so to me, I think a couple of things come to mind. Um, the first is that I feel like as a people, we had to walk a marathon to get an inch's worth of justice um, with respect to, to, convict, to the conviction, um, if, if you want to even call that some semblance of justice. Um, and I think the other piece of this is that what I can mention, conviction demonstrates is you might be able to hold this one individual accountable, but it's really bigger than this one individual. Um, it's bigger than this one incident. It's bigger than what Derek Chauvin did murdering George Floyd. It's an entire system, an entire institution, an entire country that's been infected by um, this legacy of white supremacy, this legacy of racism, this legacy of racist violence. And it's until we start to dismantle these systems and institutions and address mm -hmm. that, I think we're going to continue to see um, these same behaviors and the same conduct by police, by, by the criminal legal system, and by other systems that we've known um, have been harmful to black and brown communities for, for, for decades and for centuries. Um, and so, you know, there's one individual conviction 
it's it's a it's a strong statement by a particular community, um, those, those twelve jurors. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, um, it really does not begin to salve um, the wounds uh, that I think we have all felt um, uh, for, for for centuries. Mm -hmm. Michael, when, so I want to go back to something you said at the beginning. You said that in some ways this year has given you more energy mm -hmm. and, a, and an opportunity to kind of recommit to your mm -hmm. art in, in a different way. I would venture to say, I think others may agree, that this year in a strange way has given a lot of other people energy in a way that they did not expect. How did that process work for you? Just because, for example, I could just tell you in my own life, there are people that I personally know who say they were moved to demonstrate for the first time in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, not because they were indifferent, not because they didn't care, but because they didn't necessarily feel that that was the best way to express themselves. And this was a moment that caused them to do that. I know mm -hmm. that in the media, the, this, this word has become popular, calling this a racial reckoning. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I agree with that word or the widespread use of it. Perhaps others could share their thoughts about that. But Michael, I'd love to hear for you, how did this process work that caused you to feel sort of more energy? How did that work for you? And is there something you could recommend to others? Well, it, it also was me be, being born in Africa and then raised in England and then coming to the United States. It also gave me a complete, you think you're conscious already, you know, and, and it was an experience of me knowing I'm an African person. I've lived in England and now living in America, I actually had to, it challenged me in a different way to really, to, to see the other dynamic of it. Now, me, as, 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 as you talk about strength and energy, uh, as an artist where you've always you've always been playing black music, but now you can go to presenters and institutions and be more strength to say you are bringing black music here. Now, also for me as a curator, it gave me the more ability to, to be more strength and say, we wanna maybe create more things of blackness within your spaces. So it gave me more courage, strength, energy, but also a, a type of clarity that only because of this man's death, it pushed even us as black people to even have more strength to actually say the things we want and we deserve. Did anyone else have that experience? Perhaps, no. Pastor Koshi, <laughs> talk a little bit more about that. Pastor Kaji, tell me more about that. It well, this is part of why it's so important that so many of us are in conversation. So if, if my brother Michael is feeling a sense of renewed strength and and buoyed by by the moment then i need to be in conversation with him when i'm just completely exhausted and laid out on the floor and i'm not always there but i am there sometimes and a lot of my folks are so i mean just as we i really want to not lose the point to a to a to the rhetoric of the idea that we're facing public lynchings with these, with the aesthetics of modern day lynching, which is on social media, we're seeing black suffering and black death placed up as if it were on a tree, but it's a tree for all of us to see. And again, uh, as somebody who believes that Jesus was lynched, and I borrow that from that with, um, the scholar and theologian James Cohn and many who followed after him. But the idea that these lynchings are supposed to build behaviors within us and they work. It works for me. I am tired by looking at lynching after lynching. It might even shape how I behave, although usually in sort of the opposite way because of who I am, it makes me more defiant. But defiance is also an expenditure of energy. And I, I love that we have, you know, uh, people within mental health fields and artists and others on this call, but uh, this Zoom or whatever you call it, because it's really wonderful to be interdisciplinary in our reaction to this anniversary. It has to touch on all those points. It has to touch on our heads and our hearts and our bodies. And when we do hit the floor, we need to be around the people who will help to lift us up too. I, I want to mention that that um, as we will, we do plan to bring Shay Sheree back for some a closing sort of moment of inspiration. I do want to also mention that I'm going to ask each of you to give us a closing thought before we take a leave of you, and that is so that you can perhaps give us some intentional direction 
for how we could continue whatever work it is you think mm -hmm. that we need to do. So I just want to sort of mention that we will be doing that. So Dr. Harrison, will you pick up on that too? I, I am struck by something that the pastor just said, which is that in a way, this death, this trauma has been sort of displayed uh, for all of us to experience. And I don't know about you, but you know, I, I, even being in the media, I have to confess that there were times when I couldn't watch anymore. I could not, and I, I could not watch anymore. And I wondered if you would give us a few moments of reflection of uh, the fact that you know the very circumstance, the very tool that made justice possible, the video is the very tool that is the very mechanism that is that is so traumatizing to many of us. And I just wondered, could you just give us some thoughts about how you think about this and how you think we should think about that? Right. So I'm going to say that's a combination of both what Pastor Taji was saying and also what Michael was saying. Like there's a dynamic. I can't say that in this last year, any of us can say that everything was the same. Like you in some ways had visibility, right? Like there was a space now for if people weren't listening to you before, now suddenly at work, they're like, oh, you're black. It, it, oh, okay. Is this, this affecting you? Like they suddenly realize that something snapped in their heads and you're like, yeah, I've, I've been trying to tell you that. So you have this space, you now have the visibility, uh, you have a voice, but at the same time, it's exhausting because you have to constantly humanize yourself or validate yourself or the people that you care about. And I remember in the beginning of um, this pandemic with racism and also the COVID-19 virus, uh, there were commercials about like, See me as a black person. Like I have a family. See, I I do things. I like the same things as you. Like you constantly had to humanize yourself and validate yourself. You also constantly had to see these images of people who look like you, people who look like your family members, your sisters, your brothers, your children, your parents, your partners, and your best friends being killed. And what we're going through as a community is something called either collective trauma, and what we're also seeing and experiencing is a vicarious trauma. And it's when you see something over and over repeatedly that is toxic, that is harmful. Um, and even though it didn't happen to you directly, you can feel that, you can empathize with that and you can experience that as well. So what we really need to do is take a break. You don't have to post every video. You don't have to repost the video. You don't have to comment on every single thing. You can walk away. And this is something that I even had to do for myself after of Mr. Floyd. I was just watching CNN constantly, just watching the news, watching whatever I could see to see what was happening. Are they going to make an arrest? Are they going to do something? And I really started to feel it was taking a toll on me. And I had to take a break and stop watching every single thing, stop writing about every single thing that was happening, and really take some time to do some self-preservation. Is that something that's been, is that a relatively new insight for you, Dr. Harrison, and I'm wondering if it's a relatively new insight for others. I'm, I'm feeling that this, I don't know that we've ever previously given ourselves permission to take a break. Has that, is this, Dr. Harrison, is this kind of a new insight for you? Is this something new to be able to even talk about? Um, it's not new, but it's on a new level. <laughs> I would say it's on a new level for me. You know, I might say, okay, I'll take a break here and there, but like now it's like, I have to take a break. Like I have to save myself. Like literally, um, I have as soon as many of us have gone through a lot in the last year, and it's really, like I said, done made me do some reframing. Like, what is important? What do I need to say no to? Because when I say no to other things, I'm saying yes to myself. So I'm saying yes to W N E T. Well, I'm gonna say no to something else. You know, you know to find. I don't really believe that there's a balance, but it's a final integration because it is too much. Like it's just heavy and it's been heavy, not just for us, but for generations. Like I said, generations of trauma, generations of dealing with things like this. And we really, we just have to take a break, but purposely, like a purposeful break. And I've learned that for myself just in the last week or so, not feeling well. And like, you have to protect yourself because if something happens to you, at work, they're gonna be like, oh, oh, Dr. Harrison passed away. Now her job is open. Like at the same time, it's gonna be a listening. So if you don't preserve yourself and look out for your own wellness, no one else will. 
Michael, what about, I'm, I'm interested in your take on this from the artistic standpoint. Recently, I've, I've seen conversations that I have not previously seen before about the level of um, violence that is, is in some of our so-called entertainment media and some of our artistic uh, projects. Mm -hmm. And there's a question I think that some people have, like, do we really need to see all that all the time? I mean, I, I'm just wondering, how do you think about that as an artist? On the one hand, you know, as an artist, you want to tell the truth and pain is part of the truth. On the other hand, you know, I think there are some who feel that we, we've experienced and seen way too much already. I'm just interested in how you think about that as an artist. Well, for me, I, 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 I look at it as ancestral music and we're talking about our music, our culture, black music. And I look at really what the messages, what the ancestors told us and how they wanted the world to be through the music and art that we listened to, the Reefa Franklins and the Ray Charles and the James Bolden, et cetera, et cetera, the whole body of work of black music and black art. And, and, and they created a world for us to see a future that I don't see has to have all of the darkness which we see in the music in a certain way, which is put into the art, which makes it uh, seem very one-sided in the reflection of actually the world of blackness and what it is. So for me, I don't, I don't connect with it, but um, I don't understand it. And I don't believe that's really what the ancestors wanted, wanted it to be like. Hmm. Uh, Vincent, how about you? How have you stayed energized? I, I heard what you said earlier about the sense of, you didn't use the word despair and I don't think you feel that, but the sense of, I don't know what word you would use sadness that you know on the one hand we can point to the reality that you know accountability has been met in this particular case and yet so many systemic things sort of proceed so how, how have you thought about that vincent and the work in your own work in that like how do you and, and how do you think about that work and how have you stayed focused and energized you know i i think for me um a really big part of it is that I don't feel like I have a, a choice but to stay energized and focused. Um, you know, throughout my career, I, I spent a lot of time as a public defender, um, representing people who are accused of crimes, largely black and brown people. I spent a lot of time defending people who have been sentenced to death, kids who have been sentenced to life without parole. Um, and, and you see people kind of going through the absolute most difficult challenges that you can imagine um and through all those challenges um people do everything they can to hold on to their humanity to hold on to a piece of their lives um to struggle to fight um to push back and it's hard for me um to to look at those struggles those fights um, to people who are fighting for their, literally fighting for their lives, fighting for their freedom, and to feel despair or hopelessness. Um, mm. And I think the other piece of it um, is that I, I, I didn't never, I never, I'm not of the view that this fight or this battle is going to end in my lifetime, or even in my kids' lifetime, or even my grandchildren's lifetime. I, I think of this as a permanent condition. Um, where racial inequality and this ideology, this idea of, of white supremacy is one that will continue to be with us. It's been with us for four plus centuries, even longer than that. And so I don't see it ending anytime soon. And so I think the value for me is the struggle itself um, foments some joy. There's value in demonstrating that you're not going to give up. You're not going to go down without fighting. Um, and the way I look at it is our, our, our mission, our charge is to do as much as we can in the time that we have to push forward and then pass the baton on to those who are coming up behind us to keep on carrying that fight forward. Um, and, you know, I can't let this stuff get me down. Um, I just can't. Um, I'm actually outraged and angry um, more than I am despaired or, or, or sad. Um, and, and I think that that helps um, in a lot of ways uh, me to kind of keep on pushing forward. How did you come to this work to begin with, Vincent? 
Um, so, you know, it's interesting. It's kind of has like really strange parallels to what happened to George Floyd. Um, I was a uh, 12 year old um, uh, in 1991, um, 13, excuse me, in 1991 when, when Rodney King was beaten within inches of his life by LAPD officers and was caught on tape. Um, I saw the ways in which he was treated because of his race, because of who he was, because these police thought he was dangerous. I saw the criminal legal system exonerate those officers. And I saw kind of a righteous uprising um, that grew out of a, an extreme miscarriage of justice. Um, and that along with kind of moving from one community where I was one of many black and brown children to a community where I was one of few black and brown children experiencing that interpersonal racism that kind of very in your face um both uh, uh explicit and implicit racism um really shaped my worldview about the ways in which race shaped the way i walked through the world and the way the institutions and people and systems would treat me um and i decided there was something i wanted to do something about that um and knew i wanted to you know fight it as much as i could i started to learn more about our history the collective history um, and I was kind of off, off and running um, at a pretty early age. Um, and my mom, I have to give her credit. She was like, "You're going to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer." Um, those and, are the uh, those are the three, huh? <laughs> yeah, those, those are the three. choices. Well, how do you not let that? You said that you stay angry, you stay ready. How do you not let the anger take you over to to the point that it becomes you? Because you clearly are a person who's very gracious and peaceful and has a lot of love in you. I mean, we can all see that. How do you not let the anger take you over? I mean, I think you. Ha I think you have to find. Um, you have to redefine uh, what victory and what winning looks like. Um, you have to find kind of value and beauty and and, and, and joy in seeing people overcome. Um, um, and I think you have to keep that anger in check um, because, in a, in a lot of ways, you know, you can use it as a motivating force. You can use it to kind of push you to work harder, to to, to write more briefs, to to write more articles, to give more lectures and do things like that. But I think you have to also be very much aware of that anger because as you said, it will consume you. And it will prevent you from having the type of clarity that's, that's necessary to do the work that's in front of you. Um, and so for me, it's really a matter of kind of staying very much in touch with and connected to the feelings that I'm having in the moment. Um, and I think throughout my career, like the types of breaks that, that we've been talking about, the need to kind of turn away, the need to kind of turn it off for a minute, um, you know, the need to engage in the type of self-care um, that's going to facilitate and, and foster our own growth and our own kind of mental and physical health is something that I've learned very, very early on. Um, the criminal legal system is a system that's, that is designed from the beginning uh, to destroy um, black and brown lives. Um, and, and, and they're one and the same. The system is not broken. It's operating as it was designed. And if you if you go into it thinking that it's that it's going to operate in a fair and just way all the time, um, then that anger is going to consume you. So I think it's it's about kind of having that consciousness of of, of the reality in which we live, um, and, and pushing forward in that way. I want to remind the, our, of those who are joining us that if you're just joining us, that we are inviting your questions and comments. You can put them in the chat, and we will take as many as we can. Dr. Harrison, can I ask you the same question? How did you come to your work? One of the things that I think we've become very well aware of in the current moment is how very necessary the work that you do is. And so how did you come to your work, if you don't mind my asking? Oh, how did I choose psychiatry? Um, in medical school, psychiatry was really the um rotation that i enjoyed i enjoyed like learning about how all different things impact the mental health of and the physical health of my patient so we can't understand why someone is not able to control their diabetes and hypertension if you don't understand the mental aspect of what they're going through and if you don't understand further than that the social determinants about what it takes for them to get to the hospital what it's like to um deal with a racist medical System. So I there's a lot of stigma um, about psychiatry and medicine in the Black community, and it was a back and forth decision for me. But it was it's definitely where I see the most need, and that I can fill for my people and for the people that I care about. 
Um, there would be times that I go and talk and do consults or speeches and talks at churches, and I'm inevitably going outside and someone's like, "Oh, can I talk to you real quick about my 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 brother? Oh, can I talk to you real quick about my cousin?" Um, and because of that, I know that there's this need, and I know that our people need this support, and it cannot continue to be like, oh, mental health is only a white people thing. Like it's something that is hurting us physically, mentally, spiritually. And if we don't tackle it, even in my own family, um, you're just not gonna be able to survive. And I think that if I can comment on something that we said earlier about um, the darkness in art and how you're able to channel things, I, we need that darkness. So I feel like we, we need that darkness because I'm a very direct and I'm a realist. So we need the real to drive you because if you we continue or you live in a world where you don't consider all the things that are happening, it's harmful because I can't be free if Michael or Vincent can't be free and are suffering or Pastor Kaji is suffering or my neighbors are suffering and are oppressed, even if I'm growing, but we're all living in this country where there's so much systemic racism, whether it's education, medicine, home ownership, like you need that darkness to drive you, to push you, but to motivate you, to channel it in whichever way is best for you. But you need to be aware of what's really happening so that you can push forward and that you can, you know, not allow people to gaslight you. Well, why do you think there's still a stigma around mental health, mental wellness? in the community. Why, why, I mean, there isn't general, but why Why do you think that is? Oh, I think it's, um, as Vincent said, about a system that was meant to, the legal system was meant to um, oppress people and keep people down. In order to survive enslavement, you could not express yourself. You could not say that you had feelings. You could not complain. You could not be sad. And then even after slavery ended, it was a if you wanted something for yourself or if you had a history of running a away, you could be institutionalized. So I think there's a long history in this country of punishing people for having feelings, of punishing people for having any complaints or concerns about their mental health for Black people and people across the African diaspora. So it's been something that's been conditioned for us that you shouldn't talk about that. You never know what will happen if you keep that. You shouldn't put your feelings out in the street. And then there's a mistrust for physicians and medicine across the board, but especially for psychiatrists who have a history of doing some experiments on Black people, um, treating Black people with higher doses of antipsychotics, institutionalizing mm -hmm. Black people, things like that. So that's scary. So yeah, why would I want to go see a psychiatrist if I know that my grandmother or my uncle or someone experienced something negative? Mm -hmm. Pastor Kaji, you know I'm going to ask you, how, how did you come to this work? Honestly, I hope. But I, I really, it's, uh, it's because my grandfather was a civil rights leader. He was the president of the NAACP in Greensboro during the sit-ins. My father was a professor at Morehouse College during uh, the revolution and took over the administration's office with a machine gun to try to, um, you know, bring about justice back in the late 60s. My mother was a field director and communications director for SNCC. So I, I do believe that I came by it honestly, but I also came by it in terms of trying to find a way, because while I see the issues, while I see the concerns, and I feel the pain directly, it's part of it's a gift of mine and it's also a curse. I also see a way through and I see moments where we can inspire people to have a sense of what's right. Like if my liberation is tied to yours and you're not liberated, I'm gonna look at specifics in your life. I'm willing to listen to what that's gonna be. And, and my job as a pastor is to help us to listen to each other in that. And with that, to hear how God has been active in doing that same thing. And, and that's why I find Jesus so compelling, but I realize this is not a, a time for me to be in my pulpit. But I do believe- I don't hear anybody objecting, but go ahead. I, I, I don't hear anybody. <laughs> I, I do believe that we have 
a really good facility at naming what's wrong. And what we have to also be able to do is name how to get to what's right. And part of that is to see the beauty and the divinity and the trueness and you know the gorgeousness of each human being, of each person as a creature who was created by the creator to, to thrive. And when we see them not thriving, it's our job to listen to why they aren't. And that happens on a micro scale, but it also happens on a macro scale. And while right now, for example, we have uh, you know, people talking about why aren't people going back to work? It's a big question that's out there. And, and if people actually cared about solving that issue, they might decide that work would be something that's worthwhile, that it would pay the bills better than unemployment does, that it would give you some health care, that you could have time off that's paid, that you could take care of your family if something comes up, that you wouldn't have to be, you know, uh, destroyed by your employer if they wanted to come after you. There would be protections. We would listen to people. And this is our time. This is our chance to see the humanity in another human being in their creaturehood, in their personhood, and then to protect that. I mean, that's a divine mandate that I see as a person within my tradition. And, and, and when we don't, and when we don't see it, it's our job to stand up for it, not because we're not because we're lost, but because we're driven by the purpose of doing better. And, and this is our chance to do it. And, and this anniversary reminds us there should never be another George Floyd. And even while I'm talking, there's another George Floyd, I'm sure, or there's another Breonna Taylor or another Sandra Bland or another Micaiah Bryant. You know, so we know that continues to happen, but we know it shouldn't. And we have that hope. And that's what church or that's what faith institutions are supposed to do, which is to inject realistic hope with stories that go back into ancient times that give us give us a pathway on how to do it. It, it just has to be, you know, we have to filter out the white supremacist patriarchal um, notions that are sort of si existing within the interpretations we've heard from it. And then maybe we could be inspired. We could hear from the ancestors who intend for us to be alive and to do better than they did. I really love what, um, my co what Michael was saying about that. We do need to understand that the ancestors, you know, the, the communion of saints, as we would say in Christianity, intend for us to do well and are rooting for us and are our strength behind us. And we aren't on our own. And our sense of community as we build and as we organize is exactly a modeling of what the people before us have given us so that we can pull it out. That's how I got into this. Hmm. Have you ever had a moment of despair and how over this course of this year and how did you meet that? I've had so many. I mean, I'll, I'll just be brief about this. Yes, I mean, my job is to accompany and people through through uh, loss and especially through the dying process. And being a pastor in New York City through all that and during COVID, and also a pastor with a significant homeless ministry, I, I was invited by a group of folks who work in homeless ministry to help to preside over some of those. Uh, services. And I kept, so we were just reading the names at one point and there were thousands of names. Mm -hmm. And as you may know, there were so many people who we couldn't identify. And so I would just read John Doe, John Doe, John Doe, Jane Doe, Person Doe, Person Doe, Jane Doe, John Doe, John Doe. And we didn't know their names. And I mm -hmm. Thank God I'm a person of faith, knowing that God knows their names, but that we didn't. And all of the many failures that led up to that point, and these people were from ages seven to you know 90 something. Mm -hmm. And when I was when I went through that several times, that broke me. It, that when I talked about being laid out on the ground, that's what did it literally. And you know, my faith carried me through, uh, you know, my um, therapy carried me through and my community carried me through. Mm -hmm. 
Well, if this weren't a secular event, I'd say amen, but, <laughs> I should. but it is. I should. I should. I'm just gonna think it, so. Amen. Michael, what about you? What brought you to your work? Um, life in a certain way. I, I was born in Freetown, Sierra Leone. My mother moved to, to London, got married to an English man. We moved when I was 10. He died in a car crash that my mother was driving that I was in. Mm. And then about a year and a bit after that, she was deported back to Nigeria. Then I was really adopted by this amazing English man who was a fanatic of black music, who decided to adopt this mm. young African kid. And he really used black music to heal me. And I started getting into music and playing the trombone and piano and going to see a lot of these great musicians, the James Brown, the Ray Charles's and that pain and that loneliness of losing my mom. And it just kind of retuned it and black music kind of was kind of being centered as healing. Mm. And it's where I kind of understood the other function of black art and black music, which is to heal us and to, again, as the pastor says, to deal with our ancestry history and to, to use it to retune ourselves to create, you know? So that's mm. really how music came into my life as a healing power. How have you sustained yourself over the course of this year? And I know that you said earlier that, that in some ways this has helped energize, refocus and recommit you to that work. But in those moments, I don't know if you had those moments, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what sustained you? Can I just tell you, I'll tell you what, what it was for me. It Go was, ahead. it was, it was Micaiah Bryant. I just couldn't, 16 years old. I have teenagers mm -hmm. and obviously I'm able to, I'm blessed to be able to provide for them in such a way that they don't need to be in the care of others. But even as we are waiting that jury and just see, I, I just, that, you know, I, I, I thought I was fine. Mm -hmm, until mm -hmm. I, until then I and I realized you know what I'm I'm not fine today. I may be fine this overly, but today I'm not fine. And mm -hmm. so um, so I don't know, Michael, if there was a day that just brought it to you, and how did you sustain through that? Well, it's very connected to what the doctor says and the pastor, which is the self care, and 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 for me, it's not being afraid of talking to myself. <laughs> and I mean that in that we, we go to the therapist, but our therapist is the God in us and it is our own power. So for me in those times of seeing George Floyd, of seeing all of the other things that happened to us black people, it was developing a better internal relationship with not being afraid to talk to myself. I do feel depressed today. Why am I depressed? Because this is happening. And kind of being able to get through the hard times in that way. So if there are questions, I'd love it if we could see them in, in the chat. Um, Brian, maybe you can help with that. If, put some sort of questions in the chat. If if not, if there aren't things that we can do to serve the audience in, in this moment, I'd love it if we'd wheel it around. Um, still remembering that we want to save some time to hear the our, our beautiful kind of musical tribute um, at the end of this. I want to wheel it around and say, and I love the title of this program of Between Stillness and Action. And I think we've sat with the stillness. You've given us permission to sit with the stillness. Now I'd like to kind of wheel it around and I'd love to hear more from each of you about what actions, oh, you know what I did before we, before we do that, before we move to sort of what sense of sort of actions I think we all want to take. I want to talk a little bit if we could about backlash because even as there has been you know, significant movement, you know, in the streets. And there's been a lot more articulation of many of the issues that many of you, all of you have actually worked on for throughout your careers. I know that in my own field, there has been sort of a willingness to name things in a way that there really was not. I can tell you just a short time ago, I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many times throughout my career I have written, you know, that some action or behavior or language was racist only to have it come back as deeply conservative or racially insensitive or troubling or something of that sort. So I can see that in my field, for example, there's a willingness to name things in a way that there had not been before. But I also see that there is significant backlash to that naming and to that demand for action that is, is really quite intense. And I'm interested in your take on, you know, why you think that is. I see maybe, maybe I don't know, Dr. Harrison, do you wanna start? Like, why is there that? I mean, we even see now there's a movement to, I mean, I, I want to acknowledge that just today, uh, Christian Clark has been confirmed as the Assistant Secretary for Civil Rights after a fierce battle over somebody that 
she invited to speak to her classmates when she was in law school or or something of that, like, you know, 20 sort of years ago. And so only two day after six months in sort of advance, she has been finally confirmed to this position. Um, narrowly, it has to be said. So I'm just interested in your sort of take on why you think there is this intense backlash. What do you think it's about? I don't know, Dr. Harris, did you want to start? I'd love to hear from those of you who have thoughts. Vincent, I certainly want to hear from you on that as a person who works in the law. Do you know what I'm talking about, Dr. Harrison? I don't know if your work. Well, yeah, I, I'm definitely aware of what you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I'm definitely aware of what you're talking about. I've experienced things like that, um, mm -hmm. being a leader in medicine and medical education. I think that um, we really have to understand, and I think that sometimes people don't understand the depth of systemic racism and white supremacy in this country. I think that people don't really understand that it's embedded in every single fiber that makes up this country. So there's gonna be pushback. People don't wanna upset their privilege. People don't wanna upset their um, status quo. So if there's anything that questions what's happening, if there's anything that pushes back, if anyone says, hey, this, this is unfair, this is unjust, this is racist, and you benefit from that, whether it's, we can talk about implicit versus, uh -huh. uh, we can talk about implicit bias and explicit biases. Um, but um, if anything upsets that, you don't want it to continue. So you'll do whatever you can to push back on that. If I happen to be in a meeting and I say, you know, or I'm in a, in a national platform and say, you know, this is racist, this cannot go on. And then someone says, well, are you sure this is racist? <laughs> yes, I I am. I am. Well, do you have the data on that? That's what we hear a lot in medicine and specifically in psychiatry and research. Do you have a, the data to, to prove this? The data is my lived experience. The data is the experience of generations of Black people who have come before me. But it will upset the fibers of this country and it will ups upset people's privilege. And I think that people frequently, white people will say that, you know, I'm not racist, but you benefit from a racist system. So you have to understand that anything that pushes back on that, you're going to get you're going to get backlash. I think in the last year in my leadership position, I've been told that I'm angry, <laughs> that um, I'm acting like an angry black woman, that oh maybe I'm racist, all types of comments <laughs> that you can hear for just questioning policies and practices that should not continue. Um, so yeah, I definitely hmm. understand the black flash. Um, I did a New York Times interview at the beginning of this month about psychiatry needs to step it up. Psychiatry has been complicit in systemic racism since its inception and just making a couple town halls, that's not enough. I need some changes. And even from there, I would, I received comments that people did not like that. And you know what? I don't care because <laughs> again, we have to upset what's going on, or we're not gonna make any change. So anything that's gonna rock the privileged boat, whether or not you believe you're racist or not, you benefit from it, is gonna be met with pushback and is gonna be met with backlash. Hmm. Uh, but so suddenly, what do you think about that? What, what's your take on it? I mean, I think Dr. Harrison is exactly 100% right. And I couldn't have really said it any better um, than what she just laid out. Um, you know, you think about in the legal profession, you think about the law, the law is constructed to really protect people's privilege and protect, protect the status quo. Um, and and when the law was really constructed, it was a, at a point when, when white people were doing the constructing um, and doing the building. Um, and so they're protecting their own privilege, protecting their own status. Um, and unwilling to ever let go of that privilege, let go of that status. Um, and I think, you know, this, this kind of, this, this constant like gaslighting um, that comes with this backlash. I mean, you see, like we, we all saw with our own eyes, a white supremacist mob attack the Capitol um, and try and upend an election where there was no evidence of any fraud, no evidence of anything that was run afoul or gone amiss at all. And here we are a few months later, and you have people who are looking back at that and saying, well, you know, it wasn't really that big of a deal, or it wasn't really about race, or it wasn't normal really about tourists. Race. It was a normal tourists. It was normal, yeah, just normal tourists, tourists, right? It's like this mythology that that we have, a, that that as a country, we, we, we have to tell ourselves, at least a, a large portion of us have to tell ourselves, 
Um, because facing up to the reality and the truth of who we are as a people, as a nation, um, and I'm talking specifically about white people as a nation, um, would be too painful almost, would be too shocking to their conscience, um, would, would cause them to really call into question all the things that they have known to be true throughout their lives, all the privileges that they've been afforded um, throughout their lives were not rightfully gained by anything that they did uh, but were essentially the result of a series of interlocking inequities, racial violence, and a history of racial oppression. Um, and facing up to that is really, really hard. Um, hmm. And so we tell lies to cover up the truth about who we are. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's part of where that backlash comes in. And I think, like I said, you're seeing it right now play out. Um, where you have people who, who, who on all counts should know better um uh and, and and act like they don't um and i think that's what so, it comes down as we're, we're coming to the end of the program one that gives time for each of you to give us a closing thought and i would love it if you would give us some thoughts about what you think we should do going forward before we do i do have one question for dr harrison specifically uh a question from the audience if if, if we don't mind and the question is how do you support how best to support young people that are struggling, especially around this anniversary? How to talk with them about this? Um, well, you know, there's different ways to talk to kids about racism and what's happening, and then different ways that you talk to young adults and adolescents. But I think the biggest approach is directly. We can't act like this is not going on. We can't pretend like, oh, um, if you comply, then nothing will happen to you. Like you need to prepare children, adolescents, young adults, and current adults, seniors, everyone needs to be able to really recognize that this is valid. We have to validate concerns. It is, it is okay that you're not okay some days. It's okay that you're not okay many days, but you need to reach out and talk to someone. Keeping it inside is not gonna help. So really being open, opening the door to open the conversation and then being able to say, this is something that is a little bit too much for me. I'm gonna refer you to either a pastor, a counselor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, um, people who are equipped to do this. So open the door and validate that this is a real experience. Don't try to brush it under the rug or act like this isn't really going on because this is something that children are really asking about now. Like I have, People who, kids who are like, is something going to happen to me? Is something going to happen to my dad? Is something going to happen to my mom, my brother? So we have to understand that this is a reality and we have to really address it head on. We can't act like it's not going on. Well, thank you for that. I'd love to wheel it around and just ask if I can ask each of you for a, a closing thought. And certainly it would be whatever you wish, but I would love to hear from you of how we should, we've, we are commemorating this day. We're very fortunate to have the opportunity to gather to acknowledge this day, but going forward, what, what would you like us to be thinking about? And perhaps, Michael, would you like to start? Um, to, to really continue on, on the path of our ancestors and to, as we want to look to the future, to look to the past, to retain the messages from them, to understand how we can have better clarity in this time and to have faith and use also this time to also heal ourselves so that there's better clarity of the things we want to get done in this time. Pastor Kaji, what about you? I think that I want to just go back to the point of community and the idea that building off of what Michael said, that our ancestors are part of our community. They are part of the voices who give us the strength we need and the intentions we need to move forward. We also do well when we allow people safely into our space, into our moments of vulnerability to say, I can't do all of this, but I can do this part. And to have clarity on what that is and to have community of people who get you enough to be able to say, this is your gift in this moment. Let me strengthen you as you pursue it. And the beautiful thing about that community, and, and I believe God to be part of that community as well and strengthening that community. The beautiful thing about this is that you're reminded that you're not alone. You are not on your own in this. You have partners 
who are alive and who were alive. And that, you know, there is a breath of life that flows through you and that life will carry you through those points where you're laid out on the floor and will take you to those heights that you might experience from here to there. But even when you're not in either one of those spaces, you have partners, you have people, you've got a clan and you're not on your own. You can do this and we will do this. Know that we will have victory. Pastor Kaji, thank you so much. Dr. Harrison, I did not do you any favors by asking you to follow her, but <laughs> sorry, a, cl closing, a closing thought from you. <laughs> um, yes, what she said. Um, <laughs> um, no, seriously. Um, yeah, a combination. Um, I'm beyond mm -hmm. self-care. I used to be like the self-care and wellness expert, but I'm beyond self-care. We really need to be at the point where we're talking about self-preservation and self-protection. And you really have to consider yourself and what you need. And that's difficult for many of the, us, especially those of us who are giving, who are care providers, service providers, who do things for your community, whether it's performing or taking care of patients or taking care of your clients or taking care of your parishioners. But what we really have to do is because you can't pour from your cup if it's empty. So you have to take time to restore for yourself. And that's no matter what it is. And it's difficult. It's difficult for me because, you know, I care so much about my patients, my residents, my students. I want to do everything that I can. But I know that I have nothing left. Like I have I'm going to have nothing left to serve them with if I can't preserve some time and some some wellness for myself. And back to what Pastor Kaji was saying is that. Sometimes it's working in a group. I have a great group of friends and other Black psychiatrists. And if I can't do something, I'm going to pass that on. I'm going to say, I'm not able to do this for you. I can't teach this. But let me refer you to this one. Let me tell you who can do this. Let me tell you who you should talk to and try to bring it together because a collective is important. And that's how we survived as a people. So as she said, as Pastor Kaji said, we got to, we have got <laughs> to really do that. We have to network. We have to support each other because there are so many forces, multifactorial against us that if I can't do it, I'm going to be like, oh, but I know, do you know Vincent Sutherland? Let me tell you, he can teach class <laughs> instead of me and he can do it way better than me. So just to spread that and make sure that we get it done. Dr. Harrison, thank you so much. Mr. Sutherland, final thought from you. Oh man, uh, <laughs> that's a tough, tough crowd to follow. Uh, I'll say plus one to everything that everyone has already said. Um, and you know, I, for me, uh, part of it is is about being proximate, um, being close to the issues that that what 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 kind of drives your passion. What are you passionate about? What injustice in the world are you seeing that you want to do something about? What thing in your community do you want to do something about? Um, being strategic, and so understanding kind of when to push and fight, and when to retreat, and 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 strategize and think, um, and being hopeful, um, despite the fact that we know that these battles have been going on for generations and generations. I think we've all probably heard the the phrase that we are kind of our ancestors' wildest dreams understanding kind of that past and how much our forefathers and foremothers and people who came before us have struggled to get us to where we are today. And then we stand on the shoulders of those who come before us and drawing on that kind of reservoir of strength um, to try and build the world that we want to live in um, and leave something behind that's better than, we're, than what we left, what we, what we came into. Um, and I think that requires being hopeful, um, even when things don't seem all that hopeful at all. Vincent Sutherland, Dr. Danielle Harrison, the Reverend Kaji Doja, Michael Wenso, thank you all so much for this wonderful conversation. We are now so delighted to hear from Shay Shari, and then we will hear, I think, once again from Brian Tate, who will send us home. Thank you. Brian, Shay Shari, over to you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, that was a really, really important 
uh, conversation. And it's just great to gather with new friends, old friends, um, to have these kind of conversations. And we're going to continue to do that. Um, I'll say a couple of things at the end of the night about the conversation tomorrow. But um, right now, I have the really distinct pleasure, privilege, and honor in welcoming back to uh, our space, our virtual space. Please join me in giving a big, big welcome to the improvisation-based duo, Shea Sheree, featuring vocalist Jasmine R. Wilson and pianist Joey Ian Joe Chang. Hello, everyone. <laughs> A lot of emotions and complicated feelings. And I think what you've heard in today's discussion just shows how there's so much to impact and also so much opportunity. So we're going to share with you an original song. Thank you for being here. Never 
I'm Jasmine. And I'm Joey. We're Shea Cherie. <laughs> and to wrap it up, we're going to do a group meditation. So, again, thank you so much for being here today. We know that there's a lot going on in the world. And I imagine you, like both of us, have been very touched and impacted in more ways than one by what's happening. So why don't we all take a breath together so that we can find that strength and the vulnerability to move forward. So I'll ask all of you, wherever you are, to take just a deep breath in and then exhale <sighs> through your mouth. Now let's take another deep breath in together and exhale. <sighs> and on that next inhale, I invite you to close your eyes and exhale again. And in your own rhythm, continue taking those deep breaths in and out Maybe you place your hand on your stomach and you can really feel that inhalation and exhalation moving, almost like a wave that's going through your body. And while you're breathing, imagine that there is this liquid sunshine that pours right through the crown of your head, oozing down through every part of your body. And as you let this liquid sunshine permeate every inch of you, you feel it warm your face, warm your neck, and bring light and brightness to every piece of your body. And as you feel this liquid sunshine drift further down to your stomach, to your legs, all the way down to your toes, you feel a release. And you find that the things that maybe cause you stress, cause you concern, feel a little lighter, melt away just a little bit, so that there's space for you to feel that breath. Fill your lungs that breath of life, that breath of possibility, that breath of the future. Wherever you are, I invite you to take one more deep breath in. And when you're ready, open your eyes. And I'll give it back to Brian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine and Joey. Everyone, please give a big, big uh, round of applause for Shea Cherie. And you can learn more about the great work that they're doing uh, at their website, ShaeCherieMusic.com. Uh, I want to invite you to stay with us right here. Well, not right here, but with WNET and with All Arts, because at 8 PM tonight, um, is the premiere of the first 20 uh, featuring the concert film with Michael Mwenso, who you heard from tonight, and that's going to be dynamite. Also, come back um, tomorrow night because at WNET, we just go and go and go and go. Tomorrow night, we're doing the final uh, night of uh, New American Dream, the five weeks of virtual town halls on disrupting systemic racism and envisioning the nation beyond it. And as Amanda mentioned at the top, tomorrow night is uh, braver than the one before it, um, which is a conversation with five major authors about what the American dream means and can mean for people long kept at its margins. Uh, and also on Monday, the 31st, uh, please join us for the premiere of the documentary, Tulsa, the Fire and the Forgotten on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, Everybody here tonight, panelists, moderator, all of you, our performers, everybody, thank you so much for being here. On behalf of WNET, we're glad to share this space with you tonight. 
It's very important, and um, we're honored to do that. Look forward to seeing you tonight at 8. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 5, and look forward to seeing you on Monday for the Tulsa event. Thank you so much, and good night.